Good morning, everyone. Thank you for the trainees uh, joining us in the YouTube uh, FRCS Viva preparation training program. Today, we are going to discuss the surgical management of benign prostatic uh, hyperplasia. We will start with the scenario. We have got a trainee who has got special interest in the surgical management of PPH. So I hope we will really go to the depth of the subject today. Uh, good morning, Mr. Dean, and many thanks for this opportunity uh, for the training prior to the FRCS exam. Um, as I said before, I'm happy to for you to record and share it in the social media and broadcast it for the uh, uh, benefit of future trainees uh, for uh, who are doing the FRCS preparation. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's very kind of you. Today's scenario is we got a 72-year-old gentleman. He was on dual medical management, both on tamsulosin and finasteride. Unfortunately, he's not happy with the side effects and his uh, urine stream improvement also is not up to the level of his expectation. He was on medications for more than three years. It was okay for the first year, but then it uh, is not working as much as he expected. Long story short, he has past history of uh, metal valve replacement for which he is kept on warfarin. Is expected warfarin INR levels are 1.8 to 2.5 for his metal valve. And otherwise, he's quite a fit gentleman. So he's in your clinic. Uh, he wishes to discuss the surgical options. How are you going to go ahead? Um, I'll see him in the dedicated lower unit tract symptoms clinic. Um, as a baseline, I would like to know uh, how, uh, how how much is the bothersome uh, symptoms of his current urinary symptoms are. And second, uh, uh, b before he comes to the clinic, uh, I would like to have a urinalysis, a, a IPS sco score sheet, and a flow rate and bladder scan uh, ready. And in the history, I will uh, quickly make sure that there are no other red flag symptoms uh, the, the past history are already told. The surgical history will make sure that there is no previous urological uh, interventions are done. And we'll do a, a chaperone assisted uh, consented examination, mainly to make sure that there is no uh, ab abnormal fluid collections uh, or, uh, I mean, the fluid retention in the general examination, uh, abdominal examination to make sure there is no uh, re urine retention and a focused urological examination, MIA test mainly to see if there is any MIA stenosis, uh, testicular examination and the DRE uh, to feel the size of the prostate and to make sure that there is no abnormal nodules and a quick for completion, a quick neur neurological examination. Um, and I'll go, go through the IPS score sheet um, and uh, the flow rate and bladder scan study. And I'll do a urinalysis as well to uh, make sure that there is no infection. Uh, this, this will be my initial approach. And uh, based on this information, I'll uh, counsel him. My main aim is to see, um, where, uh, I, I will consider this as a failure of medical management. So uh, in, in a, at this scenario, I, I really want to know the uh, flow rectum bladder scan, IPS score sheet, and the size of the prostate. Okay, examination wise, um, he is quite fit uh, gentleman. He is not obese. His body mass index is around 21. His examination predominant findings were the prostate measuring 90 cc and uh, flow rate showing obstructive pattern with uh, maximum flow rate of 8 ml per second. He voided 500 ml with 100 ml residue and uh, his IPS score is 28 out of 35 with UOL 5 out of 6. Thank you so much. Um, so the information that I will use to make these decisions are one, the size of the prostate 90 cc, uh, and uh, he has got severe lower urinary tract symptoms according to the IPSS, and the flow rate and bladder scan shows that the, uh, the Q max is uh, less than 10, which is suggestive of uh, obstructive uh, voiding pattern. Uh, 100 mils of residual is approaching uh, something like a significant uh, post-void residual. Um, 
because he's not happy with the medical treatment i'll tell i'll give him the surgical option i'll tell him that the surgical options available are the standard ones because of the size of the prostate uh, the minimal invasive surgical options are still investigational for a prostate size uh, more than 80 uh, according to the eiu guidelines nice guidelines has pushed it up to 100 cc for certain of the minimal invasive procedures but the, here the most important thing is he is on uh, a blood thinner for a metallic heart valve uh, in this scenario uh, I, i will put the homium laser enucleation of the prostate or any laser procedures as a priority as these uh, uh, laser procedures has got you know, good studies which has proven that they are safe uh, in patients using anticoagulation so i'll counsel him regarding these options uh, i'll tell him regarding the uh, homium laser enucleation of the prostate option uh, and counsel him regarding the uh, uh, pre operative uh, uh, things that we can expect um, i had to send him for anesthetic checkup and most importantly because he has got a metallic heart valve he is he is considered as a high risk to stop warfarin so in his case i have to Uh, definitely give him a bridging therapy so i will arrange that with the anticoagulation clinic and will arrange for the bridging heparin therapy i'll give him an information leaflet on the laser prostate surgery i'll tell him uh, in detail uh, regarding the perioperative outcome i'll tell him that this is a day case procedure um uh, and most pro- mo- mostly for a 96c prostate we don't have to admit the patient um i'll tell him the side effects or adverse events uh, which are uh, the anesthetic adverse events the general uh, surgical ad- adverse events uh, like the chance of dvt pe uh, b- blood loss near some blood transfusion and uh, the adverse events specific to the uh, the procedure the holy procedure which will be the intraoperative uh, uh, complication that can happen Uh, for the urethra the ch- chance of uh, bladder injury um, and the immediate perioperative complications like hematoma formation urine retention need for catheter uh, need for irrigation and then uh, i'll briefly tell him ab- about the long term outcome where i will concentrate and i'll tell him that uh, information based on the data that has compared the helisa prostate hole versus trp there are enough Uh, meta analysis to say that the long term outcomes are comparable to the standard monopolar trp with advantages in that uh, uh, in the areas of uh, qmax and uh, the reoperation rate um, and i'll give him enough uh, time to decide i'll give him the information leaflet on the holep and uh, uh, if he is willing to have the procedure done because of his deterioration of the uh, lifestyle uh, i'll list him for the procedure and i'll give him the open option like at, if at any point of time if he goes home if he reads the information leaflet and if he has any concerns or if he thinks about any other option he can contact our secretaries and we will arrange for a another appointment before the surgery okay good that's quite a detailed answer in my view i will place the monopolar and bipolar trps equally on the table for the patient to choose i know okay. because of your training atmosphere you may be more leaning towards the whole up surgery which is entirely acceptable and this particular patient will certainly benefit from whole up compared to trp modalities which is also acceptable but in the early stage it's nice if you can give baus information leaflet on turp and whole up to the patient so that you are making a decision like shared decision making with the patient let sure. us assume that uh, patient is happy with whole up how are you going to take it forward okay um for whole up um on the day of surgery i'll meet him in the uh, pre operative uh, ward i'll make sure that uh, he is he he has got all the information he knows the benefit and risks of undergoing the procedure um and uh, i'll confirm his consent um i'll make sure that he has stopped warfarin 5 days ago and is on bridging heparin 
Uh, I'll check his INR on the day of surgery, uh, his hemoglobin. Uh, I, I'll check the pre-op and make sure that uh, the hemoglobin is at a reasonable level. His, um, the creatinine level is also normal. Um, and in the WHO, uh, in the uh, op operative suit, uh, during the WHO checklist, I'll inform the team that the patient is on warfarin and is high risk of bleeding. And, we, uh, and I'll make sure that the INR is less than 1.5. Mm. I'll give uh, the team a rough estimate of how long the procedure uh, will last, depending on the size of the prostate and how much irrigation that we'll need uh, for a 90cc prostate. Uh, I'll make sure that all the equipments are available, myself personally, and uh, uh, make sure that uh, the uh, recovery, the recovery room is happy to accept the patient after the procedure. Um, in the in the operating suit, uh, after the properly consented, anesthetized, uh, and uh, properly draped patient under all SFT precautions, um, I'll start with the TR. I'll use the special TR drape, and um, we'll do a initial uh, DRE to. Uh, assess the size of the prostate. It, it is a good practice to do the DRE before the surgical procedures, that's why. And then uh, start with a, a initial urethrocystoscopy to make sure that there is nothing abnormal in the urethra to assess the anatomy of the prostate from inside, whether it is trilobar or bilobar that can uh, uh, influence our uh, resection decision. And then inside the bladder as well to make sure that there is no surprising uh, things like bladder stones or any tumors. Um, after I, I make sure that everything is uh, good and we can go ahead with the uh, laser procedure. Um, for a trilobar prostate, uh, the standard that uh, I follow is to do a three lobe resection. Um, uh, we'll do the uh, initial channel resection from at the five o'clock and seven o'clock position and the resection of the median lobe, making sure that there is no bladder neck undermining. And at the level of the wear room, um, will go from the six o'clock position to nearly 11 o'clock position uh, and enucleate the, uh, uh, starting with the left lateral lobe in the surgical plane. Uh, once it is done, then the right uh, lateral lobe is resected again in the surgical plane. Uh, and the, after the completion of enucleation, the lobes are left in the bladder. And this is the time uh, uh, for, uh, to make sure that uh, the patient is comfortable because um, the next step, the mausolation is considered one of the dangerous uh, areas of uh, holop TRP. It needs a lot of practice. And uh, the main uh, um, side effect or adverse event that can happen is a severe bladder perforation because the mausolator is a really powerful uh, equipment. So I'll inform my anesthetist that the patient needs to be completely uh, anesthetized, relaxed. And I'll make sure that uh, there is a double irrigation going on. Uh, during the uh, morselation. And I, in between, I also make sure that I can palpate the bladder. So in the properly distended bladder, in under good vision, I'll start my morselation, uh, always under vision and away from the um, bladder surface. Uh, after completion of morselation, I'll make sure that there is no uh, chips uh, left in the uh, bladder or in the prostatic fossa. Uh, I'll make sure that the uh, the, the hemostasis is adequate, and if needed, I'll also use the uh, roller ball uh, uh, cauterization to mainly to do the cautery around the bladder neck because that's the area where we can expect a late bleeding and other complications. After uh, on a zero flow, I'll make sure that there is no uh, inadvertent bleeding, and I'll keep a, a three way catheter, start the irrigation and safely transfer the patient to the recovery room. Yeah, in my practice, I'll always go back in 10 to 15 minutes time, make sure that the irrigation is running, irrigation is clear, patient is not in retention and this patient is recovering well. If everything goes well, uh, the, uh, the usual protocol followed is that we can send the patient home with a three-way catheter and we will arrange for a trial without catheter in two days time. Uh, if there is any concern during the recovery period, we will admit the patient and then observe him for 24 to 48 hours. Uh, so that's how uh, I do the whole procedure.
That's good. Nice uh, detailed answer as usual. Um, and um, I'm sure you will outscore others, especially you being an expert in the whole app. But let me just take it a little bit deep on a few areas. Mm -hmm. We are planning to discuss it to the depth so that we are covering the whole breadth of the subject. Possibly in exam, you may not be given the opportunity to dis discuss to quite in detail on one modality of surgery. Mm -hmm. Let us take it from the pre-op. You mm -hmm. said about bridging heparin. Could you mm -hmm. explain it further, please? Yeah. So uh, in our hospital, there is an anticoagulation clinic. Uh, so uh, we uh, classify the patient into low risk and high risk when the patient is on anticoagulant, uh, depending, on, depending on the indications for which they are on anticoagulation. So in this patient, for example, he is on a metallic heart valve, he will come under high risk. Uh, so we have to involve the anticoagulation team. Once he attends the anticoagulation clinic, uh, they will reassess his situation um, and then they, they will prescribe him. Uh, in, in my trust, uh, uh, they prescribe uh, anoxaparin and uh, it is given as a subcutaneous injection. And uh, it, it is started after uh, the warfarin is stopped. So. Uh, five days before the procedure, we stop the warfarin. We'll start the subcutaneous heparin from the next day onwards, and he will continue the heparin until the previous day of the of surgery. And uh, we uh, advise them to avoid uh, having heparin on the day of surgery. And depending on the surgical procedure, if there is no uh, risk of bleeding, uh, we can even restart the uh, heparin on the day of the surgery. Uh, or if there is any risk of bleeding, then we will start it on with the next day. And the uh, perioperative heparinization will continue postoperatively until the INR is, his, is in his therapeutic range, which, will be, uh, uh, which we will be guided by his warfarin uh, yellow booklet. So usually the INR that we look for is around two to three. So we'll uh, uh, inform the GP in the discharge letter and we'll request the patient to attend his warfarin coagulation clinic and make sure that his INR is within the normal range before he stops the warfarin. So that's the, uh, sorry, before he uh, restart the, uh, sorry, before he starts the heparin. So that's the bridging therapy. So stopping the warfarin, bridging it with heparin and restarting warfarin once his INR is back to normal. We can use either uh, enoxaparin or uh, tinsaparin. Uh, uh, in, 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 in my unit, we, we use tinsaparin at a uh, rate of 4,500 international unit, which is a fixed dose that is given. And um, if, if you are using uh, enoxaparin, I believe the dose is 40 international unit, but it is not followed in our trust. Okay, that's good. Um, just a small change in the protocol because every trust is different and uh, I will just share what we do in our trust because mm -hmm. end of the day, whatever you say should be quite meaningful and make sense to the examiner. Your answer is perfect. Uh, the only main difference in my practice is uh, we stop warfarin seven days before. The reason is if we stop five days before, there is a very rare possibility the INR may not be less than 1.5 our wished range on the yeah, day of the surgery, which mm -hmm. may result in canceling or delaying the procedure. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other reason is since we are using bridging enoxaparin, we are safe. Just mm -hmm. by stopping warfarin two days more, we are not subjecting the patient to any increased risk of thromboembolic events. Yeah, and uh, so we stop warfarin seven days before. Mm -hmm. We start enoxaparin two days after warfarin because uh, mm -hmm. we know that warfarin will have some residual effect and because of the half-life, we don't have to start enoxaparin straight away. So we start mm -hmm. two days after enoxaparin guided by the INR. Mm -hmm. We need to make sure that the INR comes below 1.5 before starting enoxaparin. Mm -hmm. We do come across some patients where in spite of stopping warfarin, the I, warf, INR always in the region of 2, 2.3 for even two, three days after stopping warfarin. So we will not start bridging therapy unless if the patient's therapeutic range is uh, not in that INR. So it's very important that you should not overdose a patient with residual warfarin effects releasing in the INR at the region of 2.2 and also starting the bridging therapy. So bridging therapy can be delayed at one or two days, 
based mm-hmm. upon the IRR which patient is going to have every day. Mm-hmm. And then once enoxaparin is started, yeah, it's safe to stop the enoxaparin on the day before. But if you look into literature, there are many institutes stop enoxaparin four hours before the surgery, especially mm-hmm. if the patient is undergoing GA. If the patient is undergoing spinal, sometimes anesthetists are very much concerned about enoxaparin and it needs to be stopped a little bit more earlier. Mm-hmm. And uh, regarding the post-op period, again, we can restart enoxaparin if the patient's urine color is acceptable, maybe in the same day evening or the next day. And uh, if the patient's uh, urine color is uh, very satisfactory, we can start warfarin possibly the next day and patient will continue enoxaparin till his warfarin results in INR in the therapeutic range, which you as you mentioned. So small differences. So enoxaparin starting is guided more by INR rather than the fixed 24 hours or 48 hours after st- stopping the warfarin. Make sure that you understand the answer and make sure the answer makes a good sense to both examiner and you. Okay. Yeah, sure, sure. And Thank the you. whole practice is how to pr- produce this answer in less sentences so that you have more minutes to talk the actual urology stuff. So that's the main purpose of the whole training. Yeah, perfect. Could you take me through the equipments which you will arrange for the whole beam enucleation about the actual equipments? You can be a little bit more in detail so that we are covering the technology in the same way. All right. Um, so, um, so we start with a uh, urethro cystoscope. Uh, sorry, we start. Uh, we start with, uh, start with the uh, dilatation of the urethra. We use the Van Buren dilators and dilate up to a 28 French because because of the resectoscope size of 26 French. Uh, the initial urethro cystoscope is done with the standard cystoscope, and um, the resectoscope is uh, uh, introduced with the help of a visual obturator. Uh, once everything is in position. Um, we introduce the uh, Kunz uh, laser guide. Uh, guide. Uh, it, it's called the Kunz working element. So uh, it has got a retractable uh, working sheet and it has got a, a channel to introduce the laser fiber. Uh, and we use the continuous flow resectoscope, the Iglesias. The good thing about using the bipolar continuous uh, use a continuous flow resectoscope is that we don't have to change the outer sheet when we change the instruments. So uh, the outer sheet, the resectoscope can, um, uh, be, uh, it, it can receive the uh, laser working element and also the mosillator afterwards. So between the uh, enucleation and the mosillation, we don't have to change the instrument. Uh, once the working element is introduced, uh, the laser fiber that we select is uh, 600 microns. And the settings that we use is a standard. We, we use a low power laser. So the st- settings used are um, uh, 18 uh, hertz and uh, 2200 millijoules. And uh, the s- standard resection resu- technique followed is either uh, three lobe technique or two lobe technique, depending on whether there is a prominent median lobe. Uh, I'm still uh, in the early phase of my training regarding laser. Um, and um, if it is a three lobe technique, the median lobe is resected first. And uh, we follow the method as, as described by uh, Gilling et al. Mm. Good. Good, we have discussed this before. That's a good answer. What do you think about uh, using a uretric catheter to stabilize the laser fiber? Uh, it's, uh, I, I, I'm not exactly sure the, uh, the indication of the uretric catheter because I haven't used one. So, uh, one. But, uh, I think I have read like uh, using a uretric catheter can stabilize the laser, laser fiber. Uh, I believe it could be a problem in the high power laser uh, rather than a low power laser. Uh, uh, in, in my training, uh, we are not using a uretric catheter uh, routinely. Uh, so uh, I, I think the uh, indication for uretric catheter is to stabilize the laser fiber. Okay. Now you are using a 600 uh, micron fiber. The commonly used fiber is 550. Uh, nothing wrong because it depends upon the manufacturer and supplier, etc. 
-hmm. What do you think about um, the difference in settings when you want to coagulate compared to cutting? Yeah, so uh, for co uh, coagulation, yeah, it, it, it's like we uh, need a low power and high, high frequency. And for cutting, yeah, we need more power and low frequency. But uh, in, in my training session, uh, we use always a fixed uh, type of setting. I haven't uh, seen uh, change, uh, the laser settings are being changed in between. So I'm not exactly sure about the settings for coagulation and cutting. Uh, but I believe uh, it, it, it all depends on the um, uh, interaction between the power and the frequency of the laser. Okay, good. Say, for example, if uh, a center has got a high power laser, say, for example, hold me 120 watts, mm -hmm. usually for cutting the settings are something like two joules and 50 hertz. And for coagulation, they will reduce the joules at least to one. And even okay. the frequency can be reduced, say, 20 hertz or 30 hertz. Because okay. we, by reducing that, we are producing more energy focused and uh, we can create a better coagulation. And also there are some small techniques, like for example, you don't have to go closer to the vessel. You can just stay a little bit away. Defocusing can create a better coagulation compared to the touch technique. We know that the laser has a penetration up to three to four millimeters. That's good for cutting. But for coagulation, we can defocus and stay away. Sure. What is your experience or knowledge about the new MOSIS technique for hold-up? Um, so the MOSIS technique, uh, the, uh, it has a, a good advantage in the sense that the whole uh, principle is uh, using a double bubble technique. So the initial cavitation bubble will produce the, uh, a, uh, a size, something like a uh, cavitation and then a second um, uh, uh, Wave is produced that uh, that can act in the initial within within inside the initial bubble, so it's like a double uh, bubble technique. Uh, it, it, I, I, I haven't used it, but I believe that the principle is that the vision is good, the coagulation is good, and even the uh, procedure technique time is good as well. Um, I read articles of Moses technique in uh, stone surgery where. Uh, the operation, it has got a good advantage on the operation time and the stone uh, fragmentation time. Uh, I'm not exactly sure how it works in a whole setup, but I believe the, princip the, the, the principle is like it is a new technology where they use a uh, double cavitation technique. Yeah, you, you're almost um, closer to the answer. It's like because of the double bubble technique, the first bubble creates a kind of atmosphere for the second bubble to act. And so the second bubble works by better coagulation and also better fragmentation or dusting in case of stones. What precautions you will take when you are enucleating closer to Veru and what steps you can do to improve the post-op continence? So, when we resect near the Vero, we'll make sure that we are preserving the Vero. Uh, we will um, uh, preserve a one centimeter tissue in front of the Vero. And uh, all the time when we um, resect the lateral lobe, we'll, we'll always come back to the Vero and make sure that we are at the level of the Vero. Uh, by for, and there is a, uh, they, uh, now a new interest in early release of the apex to prevent the traction on the external sphincter. So uh, these things will uh, help in early recovery of the uh, incontinence during the procedure. Why do you think incontinence happens after holdup? What is the physiology and how you can explain this to the patient? Yeah, so the main reason that there is an early incontinence during the holdup is because of the traction of the um, uh, receptor scope on the uh, external sphincter. Um, and if we, if, we, if we keep our resection plane at the level of the burrow, it is very unlikely that it will uh, damage the sphincter. And also when we resect in the 12 o'clock position, we have to make sure that we are not coming too much distal in that part because the anatomic configuration of external sphincter is like a horseshoe 
configuration where it is more broader anteriorly than in the posteriorly when we look in the receptoscope set, uh, view. Uh, so um, always try to be in the level of the Veru and in the anterior uh, region, not mainly to make sure that you should not come up to the level of the Veru, but only staying uh, within a good safe uh, line in the front of the at the 12 o'clock position. Uh, so I'll explain to the patient that it is mostly due to the fatigue of the external sphincter during the procedure that they can expect at least uh, some kind of incontinence in the initial period. It will recover, uh, especially with the uh, help of uh, pelvic floor muscle exercises if the patient is uh, having bothersome uh, in incontinence. The uh, latest series says that the long-term incontinence at one year after holic is only around 1%. But in the initial period, the incontinence could be around 10%. Okay, now let's discuss a few things about MOS relation. What type of MOS relator you have? What is the principle by which it works? Um, MOS relation um, is an amazing technique where there is an outer sheath and inner sheath. Outer sheath with a fenestration at the end and, this, and a rotating um, uh, metal sheath inside which has got serrated edges. Mosolation works by the principle of cutting and suctioning at the same time. Um, it, it has got a powerful suction and the serrated uh, edges are really sharp. So we have to attain a balance between the inflow and the outflow. So before starting the mosolation, we have to make sure that the vision is really good. We can see the uh, walls of the prost uh, of bladder. And uh, we have to make sure that uh, the whole team uh, should be aware of the process of starting the morselation. The anesthetist should be aware because we have to. Keep, the patient has to be completely relaxed. The patient should not strain because during morselation, if the patient strains, the bladder wall can get caught in the morselation uh, serrated edges. The um, floor team uh, sh should be aware because the, we have to make sure that there are two irrigation running. The, uh, the other floor team who is um, managing the machine also should be aware because the, power, the suction of the mosolation is very powerful. So in five minutes time, the uh, fluid jar will be full. So it has to be changed. So it is, it is a uh, process where there's a good coordination is needed within the team. And after informing everyone, um, the mosolation has to be done under good vision, good uh, uh, irrigation, and uh, make sure that we, we, we are suctioning the uh, enucleated prosthetic tissue. And the principle is once we apply the suction, we can lift the prosthetic tissue away from the bladder walls, keep it uh, in a uh, nice position uh, that, so that we can avoid the injury to the bladder wall. Um, we usually use the I mean, we use the Piranha suction, which is the wolf one. So sorry to bring the trade name. I know that because there are lots of other uh, uh, mosulator uh, techniques are available. Uh, and in this one, there is a suction one and uh, there is a uh, cut, cut, cutting um, switch as well. So we use the foot step for that. So after, after applying the suction, and catching hold of the mosulator in the jaws of the most sorry catching hold of the prosthetic tissue in the jaw of the mosulator starts the, starts the suction we have to make sure that the bladder is full irrigation is running uh, outflow is closed and depending on the enucleated uh, prostate size to the consistency of the prostate because if it is a firm uh, uh, prosthetic tissue it is very difficult to mosulate uh, the mosulation time can vary uh, depending on these two uh, factors. Very good. In fact, uh, there are some case series or single case studies which said if you resected very large glands, say 200 grams, 300 grams prostate, um, it is not fair to do the more challenging mos relation end of hole up, which may itself may have taken like half and half or two to complete if it is a very large 300 grams prostate. So in that case, leaving the prostate lobes in the bladder, placing a catheter and bringing the patient on next 24 to 48 hours so that the prostate tissue is much more dry and uh, shrunken so that the mosulation will be quicker. And uh, let us take a situation. Last week, we discussed uh, patients' uh, urolift surgery. 
if mm -hmm. the same patient had previous urolift say seven years back and now you have to do hold up because of regrowth of uh, prostate or recurrence of symptoms what precautions you will take um so the a previous urolift is not a contraindication for hold up because the polyurethra fluoroethylate uh, uh, the pet suture uh, we can cut it with the laser beam um the problem comes when we do the morselation where the stainless steel urethral uh, plate can get, get jammed in between the mosselator serrated edges and can damage the mosselator uh, and the mosselator is uh, it, it is like a disposable instrument but it is costly so the that's why we have to be make sure that when when we see the stainless steel plate if it is free uh, if it is, if it can be retracted i mean retrieved with a uh, biopsy forceps that is the best option available but sometimes we, it it get uh, caught in the jaw during the mosselation in which case we have to stop it and we have to detach it from the uh, mosselator uh, jaws and try to safely remove it with a uh, biopsy forceps all the time making sure that uh, there is a good vision uh, that is available during the procedure very good in fact uh, some of my colleagues have come across situations where patients with previous uro lift they need to do a small cystotomy to remove the lobes so that uh, the mosselator is not damaged and also it will save time the same principle of uh, using a small cystotomy incision to remove the prostatic lobes can be used if the prostate is say 300 400 cc where you don't want to waste precious theta time in mosselation and uh, the cystotomy is quite safe it will result in early recovery of the patient mm -hmm. okay now this patient um, you are reviewing the patient in the post op ward you kept a uh, 22 french three way catheter the irrigation is going free and there is no signs of uh, any increased bleeding so what is your criteria to discharge this patient and how are you going to arrange the follow up um if the patient has recovered well from the anesthesia if his vitals are stable um uh, if if there are no after effects of general anesthetic like if he is not nauseous uh, no vomiting uh, uh, once he has his fluids like uh, tea or coffee or even water uh, uh, and from the surgical point of view we look uh, looks to see if the catheter is draining fine there are no it is at least it uh, should be clear ideally it should be completely clear but we can expect a slight amount of uh, pink hematuria coming that is also acceptable uh, if these criteria and these criteria are met and if the patient is pain free uh, we'll send the patient home with analgesics and we'll inform the patient that we have to he has to take lots of water that will dilute any blood clots and uh, if he develops uh, any urine retention he has to come directly to the ane um and we the uh, the usual protocol that we follow is to remove the catheter in two weeks time after 48 hours so we we make arrangements by uh, sending emails and uh, the patient is brought back in two days time in a trial without catheter clinic so we instruct the patient to come early uh, to that clinic in the morning and the catheter is removed and and we'll make sure that the patient is passing urine we'll assess the post volt residual and at least two or three uh, flow rate and uh, bladder scan are done before we send the patient home without a catheter okay uh, just two things to add uh, you can use the color coding strip which is available to objectively measure the hematuria status it is very useful especially if you have a junior doctor who needs to make a decision of safely discharging the patient not much used in in united kingdom but there are some publications and uh, as far as the color coding of the hematuria status is less than 4 possibly it's a good sign for the patient to get discharged one second thing is please do not forget about restarting is warfarin and uh, always try to discuss the scenarios for the patient rather than discussing in general discussing. about hold up that will sure. be that will make your job very easy and it will keep uh, quite engaging with the examiner with a scenario rather than discussing hold up in general Jennifer, because yeah, if sure. you start moving hold up in general the examiner can drag you to any questions even though mm -hmm. they try to keep uh, the key and keep the same stream as per the exam pattern sure. okay 
Let us now completely come out of Holab. Um, mm -hmm. I'm taking you back to the clinic environment. We are going mm -hmm. a reverse time travel mm -hmm. and you are explaining the patient TURP and HOLAP and patient felt a little bit uncomfortable with HOLAP because of the mm -hmm. disadvantage or side effects due to MOS relation and the word of laser was really a bit frightening to him. So he wants to go for the gold standard TURP. Mm -hmm. And if you have the options to do TURP, how are you going to take him forward? Yeah, so yeah, for QRP also, I'll tell him regarding the uh, 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 benefits and adverse events that he can expect. QRP is considered the gold standard because it has got the longest uh, follow-up and the maximum studies regarding the uh, outcomes. Um, you know, for a, the TRP can be either monopolar or uh, bipolar TRP. Uh, and uh, yeah, so... Coming to the uh, counseling of the patient, uh, I'll give him an information leaflet and I'll also explain to him in detail uh, uh, regarding the immediate intraoperative problems and immediate perioperative problems and the possible late complications that we can expect after a procedure. Uh, in the intraoperatively, it could be anesthetic or uh, surgical. What we really concerned is for a monopolar TRP is the development of ATR syndrome. Other things that can, that can happen is intraoperative bleeding, uh, injury to the uh, bladder neck, undermining of the bladder neck, um, inability to complete the procedure because of any of these complications. If it is a big big prostate, the uh, need for a staging TURP. Um, and if there are any, uh, in an elective setting, we should not get any surprises in the bladder. But if there is any surprises in the bladder like stone or a tumor, then uh, we will beforehand make sure that the patient will be aware that we'll be dealing with the stone or the bladder uh, tumor rather than the uh, prostate. And I'll also tell him the possible need for blood transfusion, make sure that he has no uh, uh, reservations against blood transfusion. And I'll also make sure that he has he's not on any uh, uh, diuretics or any other medications that can predispose to a hyponatremic stage, which I will definitely confirm before the procedure itself that his sodium level is normal. Uh, in the immediate post-operative period, I'll tell him that that can happen. What things that, that can happen is that the catheter block, uh, if there is a troublesome hematuria, most of the time it can be dealt with in the uh, post-operative ward setting, but there is a chance that he might need to go back to the theater and to the extreme that if it is a really troublesome, life-threatening hematuria, it might need a open surgery to uh, uh, suture the uh, bleeding points. Uh, in the uh, late... Um, complication that we can expect in TURP are uh, the chance of um, structure formation around 4%, uh, bladder neck contracture again around 4%, um, the chance of a uh, uh, long-term uh, incontinence rate, which is less than 1%, and the chance of a TUR syndrome. Uh, the previous CDs has described it around 2%, but now, now the instance of TUR, TUR syndrome is coming down. It is re reported as around 1%. And the overall morbidity of the procedure is estimated to be around 11%. And still, there is a mortality rate described of around 0.1%. And the need for blood transfusion of, of around 4%. And the chance of urinary tract infection after the procedure, again, around 4%. So I'll tell him all these details uh, 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 regarding the post-operative complications that he can expect. And uh, we still don't know what the exact outcome will be on the sexual side effects. Most of the time, what we see is the erection part might be better after TRP, but definitely there will be retrograde ejaculation of around 75 to even 100% in some cities. Um, and I'll tell him that the uh, his voiding symptoms will definitely improve after the procedure if not, no other complications happen, but the storage symptoms might or might not improve. There is a 40% chance that the storage symptoms will improve after the uh, blood outlet obstruction is relieved. Um, and he needs a further follow-up at around three months and uh, to make sure that there is no, uh, I mean, uh, it's a follow-up to make sure uh, that there is no uh, persisting lower urinary tract symptoms and to objectively record his flow rate and bladder scan. So I'll give him this uh, a um, general view that this is the thing that's going to happen. Uh, I'll make sure th that he knows about the risks involved. And if 
and the risks involved in stopping his anticoagulation. And for him, it's a, uh, I, I'll make sure that if there is a bipolar TRP available, uh, I'll, I'll prefer to use the bipolar TRP because studies has proven that the immediate perioperative outcomes of uh, blood transfusion, uh, uh, bleeding risks, and improper intraoperative bleeding. These these are better with the bipolar uh, resection than with the monopolar resection. So for this patient who is on anticoagulation, I'll try to use the bipolar as much as possible. Okay, good. Don't forget to mention the BOWS information leaflet, uh, mm -hmm. which is uh, quite comprehensive and quite useful, especially for the UK-based FRCS exams. Sure. What is the reason behind retrograde ejaculation in TURP? Um, during the TURP, we are removing the uh, bladder neck and contraction of the bladder neck with the sim uh, symp sympathetic alpha receptors is the mechanism by which after the deposition of the semen in the posterior urethra, semen comes out. So um, uh, after TURP, what happens is when the semen get deposited in the prostatic urethra, it goes directly back into the bladder because it is an open bladder neck. So that's the reason for retrograde ejaculation. Um, this is slightly uh, outdated view. Uh, you, what you explained, the mechanism may be correct and still holds true, but much more important mechanism is the injury to the ejaculatory ducts. When you're doing a TERP, those who are doing good resection, they will really take the adenoma closer to the veru, preserving the mm -hmm. veru. That can cause cautery related direct damage to the ejaculatory ducts, or yeah. it may be just a cautery related obstruction to the ejaculatory ducts. So mm -hmm. it is not really like retrograde ejaculation. It may be mostly an ejaculation. The evidence behind this is uh, we have got studies with, say, for example, green light laser, where they are able to preserve a collar of tissue around the viru without vaporizing and the ejaculation is preserved. And okay. uh, we know from the other Eurolift and resume, Eurolift is not related to viru. The clips are quite away. So that is a best source for preserving the anti-grade ejaculation. And even in resume, if you can maintain a collar of tissue around the viru, there is a possibility patient can preserve the anti-grade ejaculation. So in general, the modern view is uh, due to the injury to the ejaculatory duct causing an ejaculation. Of course, if the ejaculation is preserved because of the absence of the bladder neck, it can cause retracted ejaculation, but physiologically it is proven to be of less value compared to the an ejaculation due to ejaculatory duct injuries. All right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let us assume you are selecting a bipolar TURP equipment. Mm -hmm. What type of antibiotic you will give pre-op? Um, so we give a prophylactic dose of gentamicin at 3 milligram per kilogram. And uh, we use only one dose of uh, prophylactic antibiotic. If, um, if there is a previous history of urosepsis, due to any retention. I'll go through the previous uh, urine culture and sensitivity to see if the patient has got any resistant to gentamicin, in which case we prefer a broad spectrum antibiotic. Uh, usually if it is resistant to gentamicin, what I do is to contact the microbiology team and get their opinion regarding what should be the ideal antibiotic prophylaxis. Okay, you have been mentioned about uh, antibiotic prophylaxis during hold up. Is it the same yeah. protocol? Uh, we follow the same protocol, except that it, it depends on whether the patient is on catheter or not. If the patient is not on catheter, we give gentamicin. Uh, if the patient is on catheter, we give a combination of kefiroxin and gentamicin. And that's a trust guidelines that we follow on that. Okay. Uh, but no. yeah, go ahead. Uh, if there is any, uh, uh, as I said, if there is any uh, concern of MDRO, uh, sorry, multi multi drug resistant organism. Then we will get that advice from the microbiology team. Okay, good. Let us assume you are taking a bipolar TURP and uh, WHO check in and consenting everything is checked. Patient is anesthetized and uh, draped and ready. Do you know any specific techniques of TURP named techniques? Yeah. So TURP techniques are uh, Nesbit technique. Uh, more Mayer's more, more technique, uh, Flock's technique, and 
Yeah, I, I think these are the things I know. Yeah, can you explain a few of them? Yeah, so in the uh, NASPI technique, it is the early um, approach to the uh, vessel. So um, the prosthetic anatomy, the vessels are coming at the uh, five o'clock and seven o'clock position and two o'clock and 10 o'clock position. Uh, so it is an early channel resection of the five o'clock and seven o'clock and then uh, going up to the two o'clock and then, so that we can get a uh, adenoma which is relatively avascular and so that we can start the resection from the two o'clock down to the six o'clock and then from the other end from the ten o'clock down to the six o'clock and then completing the resection finally with the twelve o'clock position. Uh, the modification of these methods are starting with the three o'clock position and coming down to three, six o'clock and from the nine o'clock position to the six o'clock position. And there are other modifications where we can start with the 12 o'clock and coming down uh, clockwise to the six o'clock and then uh, anti-clockwise from 12 to six o'clock position. So these are the variations that is described in the resection. And initially, it is always important if there is a middle lobe, we have to resect the middle, middle lobe first. One, uh, it, it, it's important that because of, to create a good channel so that the visibility is better when the middle lobe is resected. It will, it will help in the continuous flow of the irrigation when you use a continuous flow resetoscope. Yes, resecting the middle lobe creates a good space for the irrigation to flow. So as long as the irrigation flow is good, you will be having good vision. Mm -hmm. um, just to uh, clarify a little bit on the main difference between Nesbitt's and Morbeyer's technique, Nesbitt's technique works from bladder neck to something like midway of the gland. So you can do it uh, like bladder neck to midway, both left, right, and base everywhere, and then do midway up to the viru. If the gland is too much, you can even divide the gland into one by third, middle one by third, and the distal one by third. While in Mormon's technique, we try to resect one lobe completely. Say if you take the median lobe and the floor, finish it off, and then do the left lobe fully, and then go for the right lobe fully. The advantage of Mormeyer's technique is, say, for example, if the prostate is, say, 100 cc, and if you are doing a median lobe complete and then left lobe complete, by chance, if the clock is on the wrong side of your wish and um, you have crossed a limit of time and you wish to complete it, you can do a good coagulation, remove the chips, and then you can bail out. And by this, you may still have a successful twerk, and sometimes patient may not need the resection for the right side. That's an advantage of more mayor technique. While in Nesbitt's, you are committed to complete all the three lobes because there will be a collar of tissue around the virus. So those are the two major differences. And you can try to bring in the names of the vessels like Bagdolac. And if as long as you bring as much of named things into the answers, the answer will be given more weightage and uh, it will be a, a good practice to score the maximum marks. And let us assume you are seeing your whole up patient in the follow-up. Mm -hmm. How are you going to review him in the follow-up? How many weeks or months after? So um, the first follow-up is at uh, three months uh, where the patient uh, uh, comes in a flow, rate, flow clinic and he fills up a IPSS score sheet uh, uh, and a, f a flow rate and bladder scan study. Uh, I, We'll also, in between, we'll also make sure that the resected specimen uh, is benign thing only and there, there are no surprises in the uh, histology. Uh, at three months, if the patient is uh, happy with the outcome, then uh, we can discharge the patient back to GP, uh, always keeping an open approach where uh, we will re receive the uh, referral back if there are any concerns. If the patient is uh, not happy with the outcome at uh, three months, which is rare after a holy procedure, but still, if there are still persistent irritative symptoms, then uh, we have to make sure that the bladder is emptying normal and start on uh, anticholinergics to see if uh, his symptoms gets improved. Um, and also, uh, he has to, we have to address other concerns, like mainly if the patient is having any incontinence, whether he is still using any pads, uh, how his sexual fun uh, uh, life is, uh, whether there's any concern with the erection or ejaculation, um, and whether he's, uh, if he has got an actuaria previously, whether that has improved. Uh, so 
uh, it's a comprehensive approach where we make sure that the post-operative outcome is good, uh, his uh, quality of life is good, and whether he is fit enough to get discharged uh, from the follow-up. Very good. That's a good completion of answer. I will just add two things for the last bit. You have used the term irritative symptoms. Uh, try to oh, restrain. Storage. Yeah, try to restrain from using it. So it's only voiding or storage. And uh, the second thing is you can still use IPS scoring sheet. That will be a good audit tool to compare mm -hmm. the pre-op IPSs, post-op IPSs at three months. Mm -hmm. And one other thing is you can bring a uh, a kind of like a telephone follow-up rather than bringing the patient directly to the clinic, which can sure. be economically a very good model. And mm -hmm. those are all the things you can bring to show that you are up to date and you're also thinking about the flow of the patients and economic model behind it, rather sure. than just bringing all the patients to a face-to-face -face clinic in three months time. Okay. Yeah. Good. I'm quite happy with the detailed discussion on the whole up and also we have covered the monopolar and bipolar TURP. Do you have any burning questions before we complete? Um, uh, no, I mean, it was a really good discussion. Uh, I think TUR syndrome is important, isn't it? Uh, during the, yes. yeah, okay. And also, um, uh, yeah, uh, will they ask about the green light laser in detail or just we have to? Uh... Possible. Um, I mean, like uh, regarding PER syndrome, the scenario is more in the emergency table compared to the BPH table. Oh, That's why we okay. haven't gone quite in detail. So right. there are some scenarios possible like PER syndrome, post TUR sepsis, post TUR um, persistent bleeding. So those are all the possibilities. Regarding green light, yes, it's possible. And um, mostly they can ask about uh, what is green light, what is the wavelength, for example, holmium also, you should remember about 2140, the wavelength and those numbers, numbers are very important. And uh, otherwise green light vaporization has such has uh, no big techniques challenging to ask, but you can bring in the Goliath study and uh, the second Goliath 2 study, which included a lot of patients on comorbidities, UTI, et cetera. And um, the Goliath study specifically focused at uh, preserving the color of tissue around the viru. That is a kind of a eye opener and change of the understanding mechanism between why retrograde ejaculation happens. So okay. if someone can understand this better, they can even try to preserve anti-grade ejaculation in a normal monopolar or bipolar TURP by keeping a cup of tissue. But that may not be good for TURP or hold up because indirectly our aim is to create the biggest channel possible in a safe manner rather than preserving ejaculation. Mm -hmm. But uh, depends upon the patient's age, patient's individual needs, those things comes into play. All right, thank you. That's Very great. good. Very good. If you have no further questions, thank you for joining and thank you for allowing us to record it so that it can be used for the other trainees for revision. And for the trainees who are joining us in YouTube, at present, you will see three links in your screen. The leftmost link is the link for the video which we did on minimally invasive surgical treatment for benign prostatic enlargement. The central link for the subscribe button, I'm sure you all have subscribed already. Please subscribe so that you will keep in touch with our future videos. The rightmost link is the link to the playlist which will give you the access to all the videos made in this series. Thank you very much.